What's going on, everybody? Welcome into an all-new episode of the Pack-A-Day Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. My guest needs no introduction, but I'll give him one anyway, I guess. You know him from Cheesehead TV and literally everywhere else covering the Packers. He's Aaron Nagler. You can find him on Twitter at Aaron Nagler. Aaron, I was wandering aimlessly through life this week, and everything felt off. I didn't know what to do. And then I realized we had no uh, let's talk football uh, this past Monday. Truly. And so I needed to fix everything and put the world back in balance. So instead of doing Cheesehead TV, you, you are welcome on Pack a Day this time. Welcome back. It is great to have you on. Well, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I, I got to admit, Monday was barren. The, my life has been kind of an empty vessel over the course of the last four days. So I'm glad we can we can right these wrongs. Very much so. I'm excited as well. Let's start with the obvious. Green Bay hired a new defensive coordinator this week. Everyone's got takes. Uh, so let's let's <laughs> add to those. They do indeed. They do indeed. <laughs> let's add to those. Uh, your initial reaction, and obviously as you've had an opportunity to kind of dig in deeper, uh, your thoughts on the Jeff Halfley hire. I mean, it's so out of left field. I kind of love it, you know, just because of the unknown factor as far as his background is really interesting, obviously having worked in the NFL for some time. But then the work he's done both at Ohio State, Boston College, what he's done in those programs as far as his defensive approach. But then going back and looking at some of the defenses he's been involved with at the NFL level, man, he's got a really diverse background. And I love that idea where we've talked about this a lot on Packers Daily. It's not necessarily like what scheme is he going to run? I think it's very much about what does Matt want to emphasize with him? I don't doubt for a moment that there's a good chance we will see a few more four down linemen, four man fronts, things yeah. of that nature. But I don't know that it's going to be some major scheme overall. You heard Brian mention, you know, it's a four, two, five nickel league, you know, that most people are running some variation of that personnel group 75% of the time. So yeah. I do think the, the approach will most likely be different. I think the emphasis and the teaching will be different. And for that, I'm excited because I don't think anybody could have watched the Green Bay Packers over the last three years on the defensive side of the ball and not come to the conclusion that a change was needed. It does feel very difficult to get a, a, a like less different ski or like a like a further opposite <laughs> right. from what Joe Barry was to what Jeff Halfley wants to run, which if people wanted the opposite of Joe Barry, I think they're definitely going to get that to a large extent. One of my we'll talk about Goody's presser in just a moment, but the, the number one thing I wanted to hear is exactly what he said in that because he was asked already about like the scheme and what they were going to run. And he said, listen, I, he, Jeff's going to get in the building, evaluate the talent on the roster, figure out what scheme fits best for this team and his style, and then build it off of that. And that's exactly what that's I wanted what to hear. That's what you want to hear. Yes, exactly. exactly. 100%. Not, not just like, yep, we need these specific players for this specific scheme and everything else has to go out the door. It's just like, no. We're going to fit the scheme that works best with the players that are on your roster. And as Goody said, they'll probably make a couple of tweaks to their process to figure out what players work best in the system. But that sort of cohesiveness between the GM and the defensive coordinator, as well as just the defensive coordinator coming in and saying like, hey, I'm not going to make any sweeping proclamations before I actually get my eyes on what this roster is. I loved hearing that. Absolutely. And I also found it interesting when Gutekunst mentioned the conversations with veteran players that will be upcoming right as yep. far as what you're being asked to do i mean think about a young guy like lucas van ness who clearly you know just coming off his rookie year trying to acclimate to a very specific style of defense now gotta think he's gonna be asked to do some different things and not not a hundred percent like obviously again still a football player still trying to get after the quarterback etc but i think the emphasis and where they play him down hand in the dirt etc i think all of that's on the table and that's pretty exciting if you're still kind of just starting out in the NFL, hopefully they can utilize all of his talents. Yeah, I think so too. And I think what what's cool too is like, I think people are like under this impression too where, all right, it's got to be, you know, LVN and, and Gary and Preston and Inigbari all with their hand in the dirt or everyone's got to be standing up. Like we could see a situation where, hey, Preston and Inigbari are best standing up. So we'll stand them up. And we think Gary and LVN might be better rushing with their hand in the dirt. So we'll put their hand in the dirt. Like I, I have a full confidence that he's going to come in and say, all right, what do these guys do best? How is this scheme best put together? And then build it that way, which again, I could not be more excited about. One of, one of the talking points that immediately you know, got put out there was, well, it sounds like they're going to keep a lot of the assistant coaches on staff. And then Spoon, I know, reported, it sounds like the assistants are welcome to talk to other teams if they want to. And it sounds like there may be more conversations. 
one, do you care? And two, like, what, what would you ideally like to see from an assistant head coaches? And like, is there anything we can even make commentary on? Because this is such a difficult thing to look at and be like, yeah, yeah. Kirk Olavadati, one of my favorite assistant right. coaches. I love him and everything he does. I have no idea. I mean, outside of training camp practices, right? Where yep. you and I are there every day where we do see a little bit of these guys getting their hands on these players and yep. coaching them up and teaching but once the season starts, they are out of sight, out of mind. We don't see anything that they do outside of like talking to guys during stretch, right? Yep. Uh, the, the, we certainly don't see the classwork. So it's really hard for me to kind of say, oh, yeah, they definitely need to bring new people in. All that said, though, I, I do feel like it's time for new voices on that side of the ball, probably across the board. And I understand the initial reporting being what it was, because I'm sure, again, I think Matt's just trying to keep his options open. You know, he doesn't want to make a sweeping change immediately if there's someone of value on staff that athlete comes in and goes, oh, I could really utilize his skill set as a teacher, as someone who really knows yeah. this technique, whatever. I mean, I have no idea what that might be, but it yep. might exist. And why cut your nose off despite your face if you've already got it in the building, a guy who's really adept at whatever it is you want to be teaching? I think Matt's just doing the smart thing and keeping his options open in that regard. Totally agree. And like Orion Downard, who worked with Halfley in the past, makes logical sense of like, yeah, he's the one really I would watch exactly for that yeah. exact reason. The fact that there's history there and familiarity, we'll, we'll see if he sticks around, but that would make yeah. sense. Yeah, that would make sense. So like you said, keep your options open, see who sticks. And if you need to go in a different direction, go in a different direction. But it sounds like those conversations will be had, which is really, I think, the most important, important part of that process. Um, obviously, just more of like a, a general defensive point of view with a new defensive coordinator coming in. We know some of the things that he likes to emphasize, single high safety, middle of the field closed, a little bit more press coverage. Is there anything that you would most like to see out of this new defense or are most excited about after reading about Halfley? Um, just anything that is already piquing your interest? I'm fascinated to see how they handle the defensive line and not only just the rotation of the players, who they might add in the draft, possibly free agency, though that would surprise me. Just because if you do want to run any of the stuff that he was, you know, privy to in San Francisco, say, you know, with Sala, you got to be able to win up front and you have to be able to win with four. And there has certainly been games where you've seen the Packers are able to do that, right? The Detroit game, the Kansas City game come to mind. Um, but it's a different scheme. A lot of, a whole lot of uh, kind of manufactured things with stunts and things of that nature, games up front. You got to be able to win with four guys if you're going to be running some of this stuff. So I, I'm... To me, that's that's the key because you have they're not going to be most likely a heavy, heavy pressure team. So they're going to have to win with four guys down in and down out. This team, as constructed, has shown they can do it at times, but they certainly haven't shown that they can do it consistently. So for me, that's the biggest question mark kind of heading into this season. It's so funny that you say that because... Of course, everyone looks at safety, corner, maybe somebody next to Quay, uh, some depth on the offensive line. I back. honestly think all of that all of that pans out and works out if you can win up front. Totally you know what I mean? agree. And you know I what totally what I mean? agree. And like, like I've seen also people say like, well, they have five guys already on the defensive line. It's like, yeah, they do. But like, if you get another really good one next to Kenny, like it's still going to make gas. things a whole yep. heck of a lot different. Um, same thing at edge. It's like, yeah, you have Rashawn, but guess what? Like Preston is, is at some point winding down, probably maybe a year left, whatever it is, it's yep. winding down. And Igbari's coming off an ACL. And yes, you'd like to think that LVN will take a significant jump in year two, but no you don't guarantee. always just want to put all your eggs in one basket either and just say, yep, we're all counting on LVN. Um, if they go and get another pass rusher, whether it be at edge or along the interior, just a big time run stuffer, I am all, you can never, ever have enough of those guys. And right now you are a Kenny Clark or a Rashawn Gary injury away from that defensive front looking entirely different. So I'm with you. Very go, different. Go get yeah. more guys that can help out. You can never have enough. You can just, yeah, if you can control the line of scrimmage, you're going to win more often than not. And that has proven true year in and year out, not just in Green Bay, but in the NFL. And it's so funny because yeah. I do think this time of year, people get so enamored with skill position players or like you're saying, playmakers on defense, which is great, man. I'm not discounting their importance, but you win up front. You control the line of scrimmage. You win football games. And to me, especially if this is the kind of style of defense you want to run, that is paramount, A number one. Totally agreed. Offensive linemen, defensive linemen, they're just force multipliers. They make everything easier for everyone else on the entire team. And it's not the sexy pick. It's not the sexy free agent signing, but man, are they needed come season. 
Uh, let's talk about Goody's presser. I'm going to just start with the easy question. What yeah. any key takeaway? It, there wasn't a ton of like major talking points, but what what were your main things that you got from it? I just loved his tone. Uh, he he felt really relaxed and confident and you know, he didn't need to say it, but he could have said, you know, I told you guys, you know, I told you so. I mean, between Jordan Love and the offense, and remember the last time we heard from him was immediately after the Russell Douglas trade when things felt pretty dire around 1265 Lombardi. And he, at that presser, was very calm and said, you know, we definitely need to see improvement over the next 10 games. And my God, they did, you know? So there wasn't, yeah, there wasn't anything shocking from the podium and I didn't expect there to be. I did find I do find it funny people's reactions to the presser when he talks about free agency or potential trades and things of that nature. And I'm like, have you watched a Gutekunst presser ever in your life? Like he says these things all the time. Like, yes, he's going to keep his options open. And I don't think he's lying. I yep. totally take him at his word. If there is an opportunity that presents itself, he will absolutely explore it, possibly pull the trigger. Like 2019 happened, right? We got the Smiths and we got uh, Billy Turner, and we got Adrian Amos all in one fell swoop, right? Could that happen again? Yeah, I guess, but I'm not holding my breath waiting for it. He is going to keep his options open, and that's what he talked about. But it's funny how everybody every year seems to have amnesia and think, like, oh, this is the year the free agency spigot gets turned on. I'm I don't, I don't think that's going to be the case. Yeah, what idiot asked Brian Gudikins that question about free agency? I heard you. We were, I will say, on the Cheesehead TV watch party. Yes, we had a watch party for the presser because we are I nerds. I did see that. We you are an individual, and I love every second we, of it. We cheered every time you asked a question. It was great. It was a lot. That of is fun. amazing. That is beyond great. amazing. Blogosphere uh, represent. It was good stuff. I did want to. I did want to ask you though about those very specific things. You beat me to the punch, but the free agency and the trades. Obviously, I agree with you wholeheartedly. It's it's more of him keeping his options open. I did feel like his a couple things one his tone felt and again you mentioned it that like his entire tone the entire press conference was very upbeat optimistic but he right. did seem like almost like yeah we feel like we can do anything that we want and like if we want to go get a guy we'll go get a guy it was just it was a slightly different answer maybe than i was expecting See, and then he's he's literally used that exact line yeah like, almost right. every year if there we, we, there we want to go get a guy we can go get a guy he said that You're almost right. every year except last year was the one year they were really hamstrung and he was a bit honest about that. But yeah, I don't know, man. I don't, I think people are just hoping, hoping. more than like actually remembering. Yeah. That's the other one, guesswork. like that he brought up trades like in and of himself was also slightly yeah. interesting, but I'm, I'm with you. I think it's mostly just, you know, him keeping his options open. I do think that he will obviously like per usual look at everything, but we know how they operate. We know that if there's a right deal for the right price, but what happens so many times is there's some dumb team that's willing to give somebody way more money than and they're this worth. This is exactly the point. Yeah. Exactly the point. Right. If you're in on every conversation, I totally get that. And I believe him, you know, when he says that. It's just that there's no way they're going to break the bank for any of these free agents or probably overpay with a draft pick for a veteran. Like, I don't ever see that occurring. They're never going to outspend someone. It's just not in their DNA. Somebody uh, in, in chat this week said, like, if they don't go get a veteran safety, like, I'm going to be so ticked off and Goody doesn't know what he's doing. I'm like, all right, we, you know, wide receiver last year, you said they need a veteran wide receiver. And guess yep. what? Instead, he just goes out and gets Jaden Reed, Malik Heath, and undrafted free agency, uh, mm -hmm. Devante or Dontavian Wicks, excuse me, in the fifth round, Freudian slip. Um, and then they get, uh, they get Bo Melton, of course, like they develop him and he's coming off the practice squad and they just fill it. And then, oh, at tight end, well, they got to have a veteran tight end. Well, instead, they're just going to draft Luke Musgrave in the second round, Tucker Craft in third, find Ben Sims as an undrafted waiver claim off the Vikings. And it's just like, yeah, we're just going to find good players. I don't care if those safeties are veterans, rookies, guys off practice squads. Goody has deserved every right to go and find the players that he wants. And he's very freaking good at it. Yeah, a hundred percent. And like, Obviously, he's working in concert with Russ Ball, and they know what their constraints are or where they can massage things. I think you heard that a little bit from the podium yesterday as far as, you know, needing to work with Russ on these things. But I'm with you, man. Like, I don't care where a guy comes from. And Matt talks about it all the time. It doesn't matter where you came from. It matters what you do when you get there, right? And I understand, like, people will probably look at the safety position last summer, right, and go, yeah. we knew there was a problem there. There's only so much you can do in every offseason, though, yeah. right? And there's only so much kind of cap space you can work with each and every year so I, yeah i i think again the possibility is there that he's a little more active i just don't think people should be expecting some kind of wild foray into free agency 
yeah, going back to last year at safety, they had no money to spend. They brought in two uh, veteran safeties in Jonathan Owens and uh, Tavarius Moore, which of course did not work out. Um, they go and bring back Rudy Ford and they still, they had Darnell Savage, obviously on the roster. The draft was not a good draft for safeties. They find an Anthony Johnson jr. In the seventh round, just, I think kind of more to take one solid value there. And then they, I think they kind of knew, like, there's just not much else that we can do in one off season and they'll look to attack it this year. It's a good class of free agent safeties. Um, we'll see if they do anything in the draft. I'm sure they will as well. The, the one other thing I wanted to ask you partially from the presser, but partially just in general, I know you commented on it uh, over on the old X machine, uh, David Bakhtiari in his situation, um, obviously a very unique situation with the injury. Um, I know you mentioned, Hey, if he's healthy, like bring that dude back. W where are you at with the entire saga? I mean, the first part is the key, right? If he's healthy and yeah. right now it sure sounds like he's a ways away. And that's literally what the phrasing that Brian used, right? So it doesn't matter what I think, we think, hell, even what the Packers think until he's healthy, right? Yeah. When that day comes, whenever that might be, um, it's going to be a fascinating kind of development as far as how quickly this gets decided. I have to think they're, you know, leaning one way or the other. Obviously, I have no idea, but... I'm, I, as you mentioned, I tweeted about it last night. I, I, if he's healthy and wants to play, he should be a Green Bay Packer to the day he retires. That's how I feel as a fan, right? Yeah. Trying to be dispassionate about it and completely remove my emotions and the fact that I really like Dave. I think he's a good dude. I won't be surprised if he's cut. I won't be at all. Like, I don't think he's getting traded because no one's going to want to take on that contract. Yep. But yeah, if it comes to it and he is healthy and they want to go with the continue on with their youth movement, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. But I do think, you know, he is a Hall of Fame player when he's on the field. Yep. And the fact that you can just so easily discard that is kind of shocking to me, you meaning the public or people calling for it, <laughs> gotcha. not you in particular, Andy. But yeah, I just, yeah. I And the other thing is people get so worked up about the pay right and the cap space and all of that and it's like it ain't your money like if I, you are telling me i can have an all pro hall of fame left tackle out on the field yes please i don't care what it costs or what it's doing to the cap that's a that's a generational player i want him on my team one of the best individual performances this past year was David Bakhtiari in week one. He was phenomenal in that game. Like when he's in the he game. He races people. He he's un races unbelievable people. with like no knee. He, like he's literally playing with like, oh, a knee and it doesn't, in <laughs> right. like his 30s, right. and it doesn't matter. He's still that freaking good, which is unbelievable. Yeah. So yeah, if you can get that guy out there, I I'm all for it. Y you know, David, a little bit. I, I don't think there's any chance that he just flat out retires, but do you think that would be a situation where, you know, I mean, obviously if the injury gets to a point where he just can't play, he just can't play, but it feels to me like he wants to do everything in his power to play. Oh yeah. I don't think anything's changed in that regard. You remember he had his kind of press availability in the locker room shortly after uh, kind of the news was out there and, you know, he made it pretty clear. He wants to keep playing and I get it, man. Like you, you're so good at this thing that you do and you've done it all most of your life. Right. And he's still, you know, driven by the desire to win a ring. I mean, that's something we've talked about both on air and off air a couple of times about how that is the biggest thing that drives him right to win, a, yeah. to win a ring. And it, you got to think the way the Packers are shaping up right now, it's a pretty good spot to kind of, you know, make your bet, so to speak, is, is to try and like get these last couple of years out of yourself and maybe win a ring here in Green Bay. So, yeah, I. I you know, look, it is going to be dependent on his recovery if he is healthy, if he gets healthy. But if he doesn't, then, yeah, there's a possibility he retires. I don't think that's off the table if he's unable to get back up and get going. Yeah, well, so I don't think he had a thousand and one surgeries just to not try to return with every ounce of his I mean, being. Yeah, it feels a little crazy to me. It does. It does. All right. We're going to do this lightning round. You can say a one word answer or you Let's can expound go. upon as much as you want. You can go in any direction that you want. So we are doing stay or leave your prediction on if they are going to be with the Packers in 2024. All right. David Bakhtiari. He's back. All right. Aaron Jones. He's back. A million percent back. Jair Alexander. He's back. A million percent back. Devondre Campbell. He gone. He gone. I agree. Deshaun Nixon. He gone. All right, interesting. I think I agree with that. Uh, John Runyon Jr. He gone. I agree with that. Yash Nyman. He gone. I agree with that. AJ Dillon. He gone. I agree with that. Josiah DeGuara. He gone. I totally agree with that. Jonathan Owens. He gone. Oh, we're, I'm disagreeing. 
Uh, not because, gone. Not because, Get him gone. gone. Not because I want to disagree. I just have a feeling for some reason he's going to be back on the they'll, team. They'll they'll keep him as a depth piece. I yeah. mean that is an entire possibility. Guy. But yeah. to my I mean, eyes, I, you got to start over at safety. You got to force yourself to get better. He gone. You and me are on the same page. I just don't. I think Goody might feel different. We'll see. I feel you. Uh, I hear you. Darnell Savage. <sighs> he's probably back. Uh, I, he uh, should be gone. Yeah, he's probably back. See, that's to me. That's the what you were talking about with Owens. I think you reluctantly keep him because he knows your program. And he, you know, he's probably going to be somewhat affordable, I would suspect. So they probably keep him as a depth signing. But yeah, he should be gone. The 49ers game just needs to be my the final Darnell Savage moment. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, Rudy Ford. He gone. I agree. Corey Ballantyne. He's probably gone. I could see that going either way. I said that. Yeah, it's a, fi it's a 50 50, but I suspect it, some of that will depend on the draft. I would suspect that's probably true as well. Preston Smith, last one. He back. I think so too. Yeah, we're, we're mostly in agreement. Savage, Owens, and Ballantyne may be the only ones where I think there's maybe a little uh, interesting there. I, I'll be I mean, look, and the contracts are all going to drive that, right? As far yeah. as if they can get them dirt cheap, you know, yep. like that kind of run that Brian had where he was signing everybody to like, like vet minimum maybe add a void year, et cetera, kind of thing. Like, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll come back okay. and maybe we can cut you later if it doesn't work out, if we find somebody in the draft who's all, just blossoms, whatever. But yeah, I think the secondary is obviously the big question mark. I just think this is something I remember talking to Pete Doherty about years ago. Like you, sometimes you just have to force yourself to get better, you know, and by keeping those types of players around, you're not elevating your floor in any way, shape or form. You're just kind of keeping it where it is and maybe even making it worse if they're, not the kind of becoming a drag on the defense overall. So I just think they, like the whole secondary just has to be better. Yeah. There's not a free agent on the list where like, if they go to another team, I'm be like, Oh no, it's just like if, yeah. if every single free agent walks and they replace them with new draft picks and maybe a couple smaller free agent signings. Cool. Like I'm totally okay totally, with that. Totally yeah. fine. Totally. Uh, fine. All right. We sort of discussed this a little bit talking about the defensive line, but any specific other direction that you'd like to see this Packers team take in the offseason from a positional need standpoint or however they kind of go about things? Um, anything that's uh, top of mind for you? Not terribly. I mean, are you talking about both sides of the ball or just on defense? Yep, anywhere, anywhere you want to go. I mean, clearly, I'm kind of fascinated to see how things shake out up front along the offensive line. We talked, just mentioned running junior, most likely kind of leaving in free agency. I think the, you know, obvious leader in the clubhouse is Sean Ryan to take over there, but that's not necessarily a done deal. And listening to Gudikins yesterday when asked about Zach Tom, man, it sure feels like he's still open to moving him around, like, which is kind of crazy to me after the year he had at right tackle. Like, he looked phenomenal this season, but it sure feels like they are still kind of like, oh, it's going to be competition and we're going to see the best five and blah, blah, blah. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that they continue – I believe they took a year off last year, but almost every year under Brian, they have taken one or two offensive linemen on the third day of the draft. I suspect that will continue this year. But outside of that, you know, it's like we were just talking about, you got you got to find um, a higher floor talent-wise when it comes to the defensive secondary. And to me, and the reason I say that I think Keyshawn Nixon is gone, they have got to be better at nickel. They have absolutely 1 billion percent. Andy, I remember you and I were standing out there during training camp practices, yeah. watching the defense and watching Nixon in particular get beat on all these like kind of ISO routes. And it's like, man, I love his attitude and I love what he brings to the team as far as his effort and what he like tries to do down in and down out. But you are on an island oftentimes when you are there in the slot and you got, say, back out of the backfield with a like a two way go, right? Or an option yep. route, or you got a tight end who can fly and you've got to turn your hips and run and like and then shake you at the top of the route like there were there are just way too many times where teams took advantage of Nixon in that manner and like we were talking about before what Brian said it is a, a nickel league right and that guy is going to play a whole lot so to me that more than anything else that position has to get better that a mm -hmm. number one priority on the defensive side of the ball in my eyes I agree. Was it the Giants game where he got beat at the end and you know they needed to get a stop? And he, yeah, yep. there's been a couple of those too. Yep. Nixon's one of those players where like 
If he's your fifth or sixth corner, my goodness, the value that you have at that Love spot it. where he can yep. come in and step up and, and play a few snaps here and there and, and fill in and then obviously be a core special teamer, um, have some versatility where you can even use him on a reverse or end around on offense, kick returner, punt returner, so much value there. But as soon as you have to start paying him or like looking at him more as like a starting corner, man, does that change everything? Because then you're always just constantly looking to upgrade it. That's going to be a really interesting one for the Packers. I think this offseason, what they decide to do at that spot. But I'm with you. I think they absolutely need to upgrade it. I have before we Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, and maybe they do pay him, but not as a starting corner. Maybe they get him as, OK, we're going to make you our obviously our returner and we're going to utilize you like you're talking about as our fifth, sixth corner in dime looks, whatever, off the bench, deep bench, yeah. then maybe, I don't know if he'd be amiable to that, but they have got to get him off the field in these nickel, nickel looks. Totally agreed. I have three players that I want to ask you about before I get you out of here. Mm -hmm. Again, you can go in any direction. Just three players that I'm having trouble like sort of placing as we kind of go into next season or just as I look back on the season, Not just not sure how I totally feel. Number one, Lucas Van Ness, you talked about it a little bit earlier, obviously rookie year, totally raw. This was not a selection that was expected to come in and be uh, a dominant player from year one. This is a draft and develop type player with extremely high upside. Your thoughts on how LVN played this year and what he can bring to the team next year. I really liked uh, the the effort and the hustle. He did look like a bit of a you know chicken with his head cut off at times, yep. kind of trying to find the ball after his initial move and things like that. But I do think he improved and I do think Kind of last month of the season or so, he was playing some nice ball. He's got to get uh, into a weight room in the NFL and fill out that frame, you know, yeah. this offseason. I think he he's only scratched the surface of his potential. Again, I'm fascinated to see how they utilize him up front because a lot of what he was doing this past year is probably not going to be called upon, so to speak. Um, but that said, you love the athleticism and the explosiveness. And when you see him in the open field, my goodness, uh, it's – caught more than a couple quarterbacks off guard, how quickly he can close that gap. So, you know, he's obviously got to refine his technique and continuing to play and more reps that will all help in that regard. But I think, yeah, it was a very promising rookie year. Um, I'd expect a pretty significant jump from year one to year two. That's my hope as well. I know it feels like forever ago, but that play in week one where he took the angle on, and not even didn't have a great angle on Justin Fields just and just chased him down. Like yeah. edge players don't make that play, especially like what, 6'4, 275. You can tell edge Fields players. didn't expect it. Like he no. was like, oh, I'm going to outrun this guy and yeah. wait a second, this guy's in my lap. It was crazy. So yeah, the, the traits are there. I'm excited to see what he does in year two. Uh, number two, Eric Stokes. Obviously, the ridiculous amount of injuries this past year, not due to any fault of his own. Um, and, and going back to the previous season, rookie looked great. Second year did not look good, and then had the injury. Third year plays what basically one game. Um, he didn't look good in that you, game either. No, it was not. How do how do you evaluate Eric Stokes moving forward for like what you have for any expectations out of him? Well, you can't have any. That's yeah. the thing. I was talking about this with somebody yesterday. I there's no way you go into 2024 counting on him. That is for darn sure. As far as an evaluation, really disappointed with what you got out of him and the you know few reps you got in 2023. Um, but that said. You know, and you know, you never want to get too overboard on, you know, oh, he's lost whatever we saw his rookie year because he is, has been dealing with a ton of things when it comes to the injury front, not to mention soft tissue stuff and yeah. maybe not trying to like, you know, overexert because he doesn't want to pop another hamstring, you know, things of that nature. But yeah, I, you got to hope he comes back and is able to hit the ground running, has no setbacks over the offseason, off the offseason program, is able to hit you know, the very first day of training camp and to get every rep in because he needs it. He absolutely needs refining. His technique needs to be refined. And I think if he's able to stay on the field, there's still a lot of promise there. We just never know, right? It, especially over the course of the last kind of calendar year and a half. It's It's been really frustrating for him more than anyone else. And I don't know how you can get an evaluation until you get him on the field with regularity. So again, I don't, there's no way you can have any expectations. You, you, you kind of treat him like a lottery ticket. I think at this yep. point, like if he comes in and balls out and looks really good in camp and you get to week one and he's ready to go, then awesome. You've got a corner who you know you can trust, but yeah, it's, it's hard right now to have any kind of faith that you have anything there until you can see him on the field with regularity. 
per usual, we are once again in lockstep. And then last but not least, last question for you, Carrington Valentine. Can you feel, do you feel comfortable going into the season next year with him as the starter opposite Jair? Uh, do you want competition? Do you just want a pure upgrade? How are you feeling about Carrington after year one? I love his attitude and I want yeah. him to compete, but it's got to be competition. Absolutely. He hasn't arrived in any real sense of the word. I think he really held his own in games where I think, you know, teams probably expected to take advantage of him and weren't able to maybe as much as they thought they could. Um, certainly was a target at times, but I thought he responded well. I don't doubt for a moment that this change on the defensive side of the ball with the coordinator and a new philosophy and a new scheme, probably it's going to help him. I think, uh, I don't doubt for a moment that he is going to be asked to maybe do a little bit more of the press man stuff we saw in camp and we saw he's up for it. Right. It yep. doesn't necessarily mean he's good at it. You know, like he's very, he's very uh, eager to do it. And there are certainly reps you can point to where you say, oh, that's that's looking pretty promising. But there's also reps, especially in the season, where you saw opposing wide receivers able to kind of take advantage of his aggressiveness. I think, again, more refinement, more competition, 100%. But I, I like what they have there. I think there's there's some upside. And don't forget, and I know you remember this, he played a little bit of slot corner towards the end of camp in the last preseason game. Maybe they give him an extended audition there. Because, again, I think he's got – some explosiveness and some fluidity that might be able to translate inside. So I, he's a, he's a promising young player. And I think more reps and more competition are the absolute key for him going forward. I would love to see them find a hybrid safety corner that could play the slot on early downs as like a third safety. Right. And then on obvious passing downs, kick Carrington inside and just use his raw coverage skills. Cause him against the run, not great. Um, but if yep. they bring in maybe somebody that can platoon with them there, I think that could potentially be a really good fit. I'm excited about Carrington, but we are once again on the same page, I think competition and just push him. But I think there is a, a ceiling not like a, I think there's a high ceiling there, meaning he can be a legit starter in this league. And hopefully he takes that step totally as well. Agree. Just totally like an agree. LVN. But the only Aaron, way you take that step is getting reps and having competition, right? Like, it's the danger of like he is nowhere near arrived, and I don't think the Packers think that. But he's yep. he, he like he's got to keep progressing, and I think this first season was very very promising. If they don't think Rashid Walker arrived and keep talking about how he needs to continue to put, like I guarantee, like they right. feel like all like all right. these guys because there's some good tape over there on Walker, but they're like you know he still needs to get better. There's a, you know so th they absolutely feel like they feel that way. Aaron, amazing, amazing stuff as always. Thank you so much for taking some time on a Friday to chat with me. Uh, tell all the amazing people about Cheesehead TV. I know you've got some exciting new stuff. I don't know if the, if uh, you want to spill any tea of like all the new exciting content for Cheesehead TV, <laughs> anywhere you want to go. Uh, there's no new tea, but uh, we have some things in the hopper, so to speak. Uh, just keep watching Cheesehead TV. we got a lot of fun new content coming both this offseason and into next season. It's going to be a good time. Um, it's just CheeseheadTV.com, man. Carry the G. That's what we're about. Here's the big question. Is there a sequel to Carry the G Beer? Is there like going to be like a, is there gonna be like a new flavor? Is there going to be there, you know, uh, a, funny, funny a you Banky Bach? Can we do a Banky Bach? Can we do something? There, there is there is not a beer in the works, but there is another spirit in the works. I love so it. Be on the lookout for that. All right, I'm all in. I cannot wait. Aaron, thank you, thank you again for taking the time. Of course, you can find him on Twitter at Aaron Nagler. You can find me at Andy Herman NFL. That's going to do it for us today. But until next time, and as always, go Paco. Go pack.